This is part one of our section on Hinduism. Welcome. I hope you're excited for this. I'm excited for it. Uh, this first page you're looking at here, I have uh, the, common, the common symbol for Hinduism. It's the Om sign. It's a Sanskrit word. Uh, and it is in fact written here in Sanskrit, Om. That's said to be the sacred sound that, that began the universe. Um, in fact, Hinduism doesn't have exactly one symbol that, that represents it. Um, of all the religions we're going to study, um, Hinduism is, is probably the most diverse uh, across uh, all of the subcontinent of India. It is, um, it is a very diverse religion. And the Om symbol um, is a very common sacred symbol used by all Hindus, and for that reason, it's often represented as, as the symbol for all of Hinduism. Um, I started with a quote here on this first page. It's from the Rig Veda, which we're going to talk about today. It says, truth is one. Sages call it by various names. That's very true for Hinduism. Uh, this picture at the bottom is that of uh, some um, Hindus, some men and women, uh, at the river Ganges, which is a sacred river. It's, it's a manifestation of the, the goddess Ganges. And you can see uh, they all have um, offerings in their hands of, of bread and incense. Um, and they're offering um, these things to the goddess. Um, and you can see uh, they, they're all submerged in the water. Uh, the Ganges is a very important river to Hindus and most Hindus will try to travel to it at some point in their life and bathe in it to uh, purify themselves of uh, sin and karma. Okay. Um, today we're going to try to introduce Hinduism a little bit. We're going to talk about the Indus Valley civilization, the history of Hinduism, which is fascinating, and we're going to uh, learn some the basic Hindu texts, the basic Hindu canon. Um, it is religion, or Hinduism is one of the oldest extant religions. Extant meaning still existing. This, it is. Uh, it dates back as early as uh, 2500 BCE, 4500 years ago, and probably long, probably earlier than that. It might be as old as as five or six thousand years old. Um, it is practiced by approximately 850 million people, most of whom are in India, um, and those of whom aren't in India are, are still of, of Indian uh, descent. Um, it has around 330 million deities. It's 330 million different um, gods and goddesses uh, to choose from. As I say, it's a very diverse religion. Um, it should be noted, and we'll talk a little bit more about this tomorrow, that, that um, Hin Hinduism, the name Hinduism, was a name uh, for the religion that was imposed by um, by non-Indians, by by um, other people. Basically, um, Hinduism, the tradition of the Indian people, has been um, practiced for millennia, just thousands and thousands of years. There are many different deities in different regions of India and different villages all kind of have their own preferred gods or goddesses that they follow, which come with their own rituals, their own stories, um, that are all, ultimately, they're all part of the same unseen reality, right? But there's a lot of room, I guess you could call it, say, for personalization and um, different places um, practice uh, in different ways. So when um, Muslims and Christians and other uh, traders from the West and other traders from China, other places, came to India uh, and they asked them, you know, what is this that you practice? What is this religion? Um, you know, Indians didn't really have an answer for that question. They always imagined that, always imagined that they, the Indians looked at the, the uh, foreign traders and said, yes, this is religion, this is what we do. They, the foreigners said, no, 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 but what religion is it? What do you call this religion? And the Indian people might have said, yeah, that's right, we call this religion. <laughs> they, didn't, they didn't have a name for it. So uh, the name Hinduism was given to them, and it comes from the word for Indian, Hindu-Indian, right? You can see the relation there. Um, so uh, 
there wasn't really an idea though that 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 there had to be a name for for the entirety of this tradition and certainly up until um, uh, foreign powers conquered India, specifically uh, Great Britain, um, you know, India was, was always divided between city-states and kingdoms and things like that, and various um, invaders who came through and, and formed larger kingdoms, but India as a whole was not India until, um, until England uh, made it a colony. Um, that's an important part to understand um, how we understand their religion. Um, there's an, another interesting part of Hinduism that is that um, in in the Indian languages, there's no word for religion. The word that they use to describe their tradition is Dharma, and it has many many definitions. Dharma means um, a path. It means duty. It means teachings. It means religion and a certain way. Um, it means many, many different things. The book does a good job talking about it. Um, and yet religion is very much imbued into Hindu life, right? Hinduism is very much a practice. It's not so much a belief. It's not about what you believe in. It's about the way you practice and the way you bring devotion into your life. The most fascinating things about Hinduism is that, uh, Every part of your life, every level of your life can be an act of devotion from taking care of your family, um, you know, working to bring home, you know, uh, to support your loved ones, to going to the temple or, or uh, giving offerings to an altar that you have at home or studying the Hindu texts. These are all forms of devotion uh, in Hinduism religion. Dharma is something that you do. It's something active. Um, and we'll have a chance to talk about that in part three of this lecture series on Hinduism. I wanted to show you a picture here of, of what it looks like when, when people go to temples in India. So these are a couple of uh, Hindus, devotees. Uh, these are priests, Hindu priests. And in Hinduism, you can go to a temple and, and, and give the priest a fee and they'll do a special um, service for you to um, bring blessings upon you. You can also do a service yourself. You can, you can devote um, and give offerings at home or, or um, at sacred places like the river Ganges or, or at sacred trees or mountains or all sorts of sacred places in, in Hinduism. Particular, this is... Uh, a um, temple to the goddess Lakshmi, who's the goddess of fortune and prosperity, and she's one of the most popular deities in Hinduism in India, obviously because she's very kind and because uh, gaining her blessings brings, um, brings fortune and children and health and happiness to your life. Um, and this picture was taken at Diwali, which is one of the biggest Hindu holidays. It's the holiday of light. Um, and Lakshmi is, is often um, worshipped or revered at that time. You can see there's all sorts of food offerings here that can be used. They've brought offerings themselves to, 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 to give to the goddess. Um, her, her statue is, is um, decorated with flowers. Um, and we'll talk about the way um, these statues um, work in Hinduism, what they mean, how they embody um, the, the deity. Uh, by the way you treat them. Um, and it's quite fascinating. Yes. Um, so the history of Hinduism goes back to at least 2500 BCE, as I mentioned, to the Indus Valley Civilization. The Indus Valley Civilization is one of the great Four Rivers Civilizations of the ancient past, which include the Nile, Egypt, the Egyptian civilization, which was built around the Nile, uh, the, the Fertile Crescent, which is uh, which was Mesopotamia, you ever heard stories of Mesopotamia, was where um, modern Iraq uh, is now, and that was once, uh, there was once a much larger river there, the Tigris, um, around which a, a great civilization was built. There's the ancient Chinese civilization that was built around the Yellow River, and then there was the Indus Valley River, uh, civilization. Now, sometime around 1500 BCE, there were a lot of climate changes and the, a lot of the riverbeds uh, dried up and uh, the people, the civilization there had to leave. But for about thousand, a thousand years, it was just a huge civilization uh, 
uh, well, for, for ancient times, a huge civilization there um, that had developed irrigation and government, um, beautiful architecture and art, uh, writing system, um, some kind of writing system. We're not exactly sure about it. Um, you can see here there are two places they mention Harappa and Mohenjo-Daro are two major archaeological sites um, where they found all sorts of um, fascinating relics and things. Um, so part of Indian history is, is this legend of the Aryans and it's important to mention um, we don't exactly know who the Aryans are. There was for a long time a belief that the Aryans were um, were invaders that came from the West, who came from west of uh, Pakistan, and that they um, they conquered this area here, uh, and that they they helped develop the Indus Valley civilization. The Vedas, which are the scriptures, usually describe Aryans as noble people who speak Sanskrit, which is one of those ancient languages in the world, um, and practiced certain kinds of Vedic religious traditions. So that kind of um, flies in the face of the Aryan invader um, theory. Um, the fact of the matter is we don't really know who the Aryans are. We know that they spoke Sanskrit and they wrote in Sanskrit and they seem to be very educated. Um, and uh, that's kind of that's kind of all we know about them. They, they did play some sort of important role in that history. So the history of Indian religion is ancient and it's very rich um, and it's just fascinating if you ever wanted to do some more research on it, I would recommend it. Let me show you some other things. Now here are some uh, different artifacts that have been found in the Indus Valley Civilization in, in Mohenjo-Daro and, and, and Harappa. Let's start with these here, these little um, statues. There's a, a dancing woman here, might be, might be a servant woman, um, some sort of deity, some sort of being with three faces. We have the image of, of uh, an ox pulling a cart um, and a man and, and a woman. They're all very stylized. Note that the, the styles of art here are very, very, very different. The materials used are all very different. This woman here, look at her. She's very reminiscent of, she has like kind of um, Northeast African features, maybe like of a, a Somali woman, modern day Somali or Ethiopia. This man here, the style of art is much more similar to what they were doing um, in Mesopotamia in the Middle East at the time. Um, this one, I would say, uh, is kind of reminiscent of some early um, Chinese folk art, you know, the, the water ox head. I might be wrong about that, but that's the way it looks to me. And uh, many other styles of art. So what that tells us is that the Indus Valley were, the Indus Valley civilization was trading, was having diplomatic relations of some kind with civilizations all over the world. And so they had all sorts of different influences, religious, uh, cultural, artistic influences coming in through that area. And so it was a great, um, it was a great um, period of history when when a lot of um, civilization um, was was blooming and flowering. And what you see, the rest of what I have here are these little these little square seals. We have many of them. We have many examples of them, and we don't really know what they are. Archaeologists don't exactly know what they are if they were used as um, you know maybe individuals just had their own seal that was you know had something to do with um, their their um, trade or their family or you know something about their background um, or if these were used in business if they were used you know if they were merely decorative um, you can see that there are symbols here you see all these little symbols right we have no idea what those are. <laughs> um, they seem to be they seem to be some sort of writing, but there are so few, and they appear in such small little groups that we've never been able to decipher them. We've never been able to figure out what they mean or what they say. Um, but they they fascinate they fascinated historians and, and religious historians for a long time. Down here, you see the famous swastika. Right, which we mentioned in the in uh, the second lecture, the introduction. Right, swastika is actually a Sanskrit word. Uh, 
it comes from the from su which means good and stika which means uh or i'm sorry isti which means uh it is swastika means it is good it is good and it is uh, a blessing right um though what it meant in ancient times if it if it meant the same thing in ancient times we don't really know but we do have examples of it here you see uh a figure sitting in a meditative pose. You see he's like sitting cross-legged meditatively. Uh, and he has these horns. Now, the modern um, deity Shiva, the Hindu deity Shiva, is some, sometimes shown with horns. And he's also sometimes, or he's often portrayed as like the god of, uh, of yoga and of various like uh, meditative practices. So there's a lot of question about whether or not this could be an early image of Shiva. Uh, it would be it would be amazing if it was and we but we don't really know. You can see there are these animals all around him. Looks like a, there's like an elephant, a tiger, um, and he's sitting very calmly. Um, so uh, it's a really rich it's a really rich ancient history. And I should also note that if this is writing, if we if, if this is actual writing and not just, you know, there a lot of ancient civilizations had little pictographs, you know, that that weren't uh, weren't used to like write out sentences the way we do today. They were more just used as like symbols that you could, you know, use um, in record keeping. Um, but if this is more, if these are more than just little symbols, if this is writing, then it might be the um, oldest writing in, in human history. So uh, it's pretty, it's pretty exciting. Um, I am a historian of religion myself, so I find this fascinating. I can't, I can't teach any religion without including um, some historical tidbits about it. So uh, moving on, let's take a look at the texts, the important texts in Hinduism. So there are two kinds of texts, uh, Hindu texts that we find. There are Shruti and there are Smriti. I'm going to look at both in turn. Shruti means revealed. These are texts that were revealed uh, by the unseen reality through inspiration, through revelation, through, you know, however, however the gods um, reveal things to people. Revealed to rishis who were who were wise men who were said to live in the forests and commune with nature and with God. They were ascetics. This is an important word, so I've 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 italicized it because I want you to remember this word ascetics. We use this a lot. An ascetic is somebody who denies themselves basic material um, goods and pleasures in order to kind of purify their minds or become more spiritual. So uh, people who, who take vows of poverty, monks and nuns or hermits who live out in, in the countryside, um, these are uh, ascetics. Um, and there are a lot of lesser ascetic practices that people do as well. You know, they give up, they, they avoid drinking or smoking or or you know things like that. They they give money away to the poor, whatever it is. This is asceticism, basically. And of course, they were also mystics. Anyone who is um, looking to have an, a direct encounter with the with the divine is, an, is a mystic. So these these ancient mysterious rishis received or 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 had the the shruti revealed to them. And according to legend, um, it was revealed to them between eight thousand and six thousand BCE. Um, we don't, historically speaking, we don't really know when they started, when the Shruti came to be. Um, but according to legend, it was as early as 8,000 BCE. Um, the two of the most famous uh, Shruti texts are the Vedas and the Upanishads. The Vedas are very, very famous. They're, they're, they're like the oldest of um, the Shruti. Um, I mentioned in one of the past slides I, met, slides I mentioned uh, Vedic religion, that the Aryans were said to practice Vedic religion. It's based on the Vedas. Uh, there are four volumes of Vedas. They are the oldest extant scriptures. Um, they mostly contain hymns, hymns of praise and worship to the various gods and also sacred sounds like the Om. The Om is a sacred sound. People me uh, meditate on the Om uh, and other sacred sounds. Um, one, the most significant of the Vedas is the Rig Veda, 
um, which is just considered a masterpiece of both both of, of, of like poetry and of um, philosophy and theology. Uh, according to legend, there was a particular person, the, the Vyasa, who was the collector, who compiled the Vedas and wrote them down around 3102 BC, if we're going to be specific, around 3102 BC. Um, according to, to Hinduism, Vyasa was actually just an incarnation, a manifestation of the god Vishnu, uh, who, who saw that um, civilization was going to start breaking down and that um, these Vedas needed to be protected by being written down. And they were written down in Sanskrit. Um, some of the other Shruti texts include the Brahma, the, Bra the Brahmanas, the Aranyakas, and the Upanishads which are great teachings of wisdom and philosophy. And uh, these texts, the Upanishads, the Vedas, most of the Shruti, are not really, um, they're not taught to all Hindus. Not all Hindus study them. Um, these are texts that are, that are supposed to be um, only for um, highly spiritual people, highly intelligent people. You know, um, these are great mysteries and, and, and philosophical treaties um, that aren't for everyone. Um, the focus, the other thing that, about the, the Upanishads is that uh, they don't focus so much on outward ritual performances, which is what makes up most of, um, or a lot of Hindu practices, is like these outward ritual performances, but it's more about um, inner experiences um, and trying to find realization, trying to find liberation from uh, reincarnation, which is something we'll talk about more in the next um, lecture. Um, but the Upanishads, the Vedas, the Brahmanas, these are all very mystic texts. They're all about um, getting closer to the divine. Um, and I have some samples here. This is from the Rig Veda. It says, let me now sing the heroic deeds of Vishnu, who has measured apart the realms of the earth, who propped up the upper dwelling place, striding as far as he stepped forth three times. They praise for his heroic deeds, Vishnu, who lurks in the mountains, wandering like a ferocious wild beast, in whose three wide strides all creatures dwell. Okay. The second part is, uh, the second quote here is from uh, the Upanishad, the Chand Chandogya Upanishad. It says, in the beginning there was existence alone, one only, without a second. He, the one, Brahman, thought to himself, let me be many, let me grow forth. Thus out of himself he projected the universe, and having projected out of himself the universe, he entered into every being. All that it, all that is has itself in him alone. Of all things he is the subtle essence. He is the truth, he is the self, and that, that art thou. So uh, the first one, you can see the difference, right? The, the Upanishad, the second um, text here, it's very philosophical, right? It's philosophy that, that the one became many and that we're all part of the one. Um, uh, this, this idea of the Brahman. Um, uh, and some, some people even say that, that this is proof, proof that in some ways Hinduism is kind of monotheistic, it's not polytheistic, that rather even the gods themselves came from the one, that there's a one that's above everything, even the gods. In that sense, um, Hinduism is, is monotheistic. Um, it's not exactly true, but um, this, this text is used sometimes to argue that. Um, the first one from the Rig Veda is, as you can see, it's, it's much more about um, honoring Vishnu or, or, and other gods and goddesses. It's about um, praising them. It's about the stories, you know, that Vishnu propped up the upper dwelling place and he measured out the universe with his strides. Um, so there's a lot going on here. That you, these texts teach you about um, what the gods are, about what they did, about what that means to you, you know, as a, as a person, as a person in the universe, um, how you fit into it. Um, and in their original form, you know, they're, they're also very, they're, they're poetic, they're hymns, they're to be sung and recited. Um, so they're just wonderful pieces of literature um, and very important part 
of um, world literature. If you ever take a world literature class, no doubt you're going to read some of this. Um, now let's talk about the Smriti. Smriti are um, the other kind of um, sacred texts in Hinduism, and the Smriti are more the stories, the epics, um, Puranas. Um, these were not compiled until after 500 BCE, which is still incredibly ancient. That's still 2,500 years ago, but quite late as compared to, to the Shruti, which were, you know, 2,000 years before that even. Um, the main two texts in the, of the Smriti, which by the way, Smriti is um, the recorded, right? These are the recorded texts. No, they weren't revealed. Um, it's not exactly clear how they were um, passed down to um, to humanity. Um, Hindus would say that these are, you know, these are these are stories of what happened. You know that they that these might in some way be historical, um, though not all Hindus are attached to the idea of these being historically accurate. It's something that's different from Western civilization or Western religion, where um, you know. Uh, followers of Christianity, Judaism, and Islam are, are very much um, very much believed that that the Bible, the Quran, the Hebrew scriptures are all historical documents. These are things that happened. In Hinduism, you know, it's not as important whether or not you believe that, but some people do. Some people do. The two great epics of uh, the Samriti are the Ramayana and the Mahabharata. And uh, they are incredibly long. The Ramayana is three times longer than the Bible. Uh, the Mahabharata is 12 times longer than the Bible. Mahabharata is one of the longest pieces of poetry. I think it's the, th it's the third longest piece of poetry in, in, in world civilization. The Mahabharata includes the Bhagavad Gita, which we're going to talk about in the next lecture. The Ramayana is uh, the, the Ramayana Mahabharata are these great epics that um, that you know, start very small and, and you know, have, have this kernel story of, for example, in the Ramayana of, uh, of a prince who is tricked into, um, into leaving his kingdom and is exiled from his kingdom for, I think, 12 years. And he brings his brother and his wife with him. And while they're, while uh, Rama, the prince, is, is, is living out in exile, his wife gets kidnapped by a demon. And then, you know, there's like this long story where he has to go and rescue her. And along the way, he meets different characters and every character has their own story. And, you know, it's, it's, at its, at its basis, the, the kernel story is very kind of simple, but it's, it's extended out into this huge, huge epic. And the Mahabharata even more so. Um, the Mahabharata is a story of, um, of a family, of a royal family that is warring amongst itself for, for political power and how that leads to a great war. Um, and uh, these aren't they're not just entertaining stories, though, and they're not just, they're in no way meant to be like historical stories about, and this is why, you know, India is the way it is. They're more stories that, that teach lessons. They have a lot of morals and, and they have a lot of examples of the correct way to act and the incorrect way to act and, and the, uh, what people's roles are in society. How does a good wife act, you know, when she's under pressure? How does a good son act? How do you act when um, people are, are working against you? You know, um, uh, these are great examples for, for how to live. Um, and we're going to have a chance, you're going to have a chance to watch um, a version of the Ramayana, a very shortened version of the Ramayana. I think it's only 10 minutes. Um, and get a little bit of that story. And, and uh, in the next lecture, we're going to look more carefully at the Mahabharata. Um, the other group of Smriti are the, the Puranas, which are compilations of various other stories. Um, just groups of stories, of, uh, especially about the gods and goddesses and, and famous mythical characters like Rama uh, from the Ramayana. And um, there are multiple Puranas. It's, there's not just one set of, of Puranas. There are many Puranas. Uh, a lot of times Puranas are, are compiled into children's books. I have a friend, um, 
I don't have it now. She lent me a, a copy of the Piranha that she grew up with. It's just, it's, it's, it's the equivalent of a chi uh, uh, children's Bible, you know, with just like uh, famous stories that teach important lessons for children about, you know, loyalty, about not lying, about where the world came from, you know, all these kinds of things. Um, and they're, they're important teaching tools in Hinduism. They're very important teaching tools. Um, so, um, that is about it for this lecture. For, um, the discussion today, I'm going to have you do a couple things. I'm going to have you watch a video that I've put a link to, uh, on the lesson website about the Ramayana. It's a children's version. Um, I think the, the best summaries, the best shortened versions of, of the great epics are always children's versions. And it also has beautiful Indian artwork, which I love. Um, so you can watch the story of the Ramayana. And then on page 93 of your textbook, there is a box that says teaching story. It's Hanuman, the monkey chief. Um, if you have a different edition besides the ninth edition, it might not be on page 93, but it will have somewhere in in those pages will be a box that says Hanuman the monkey chief. Um, so read the story of Hanuman and watch first watch the video of Ramayana and that will introduce, introduce Hanuman to you and then read the story of Hanuman and then the discussion question is what sorts of lessons do these stories teach for children, for adults, for, for all Hindus, for, for all people. Um, and one thing you, to mention you know, to really appreciate these stories, you have to know that Hanuman is probably the most popular of these mythical figures. He's like, he's like Superman. He's, he's very much like, like an ancient Superman. He could fly, he was very strong, and stories he lifts, he carries mountains and swallows the moon and, and jumps across oceans, and he's, you know, a great warrior. Um, and he's a very, very popular character. So, so look at the way he acts and how he's an example and how Rama and his brother and his wife are all examples for people and what lessons they teach. Okay?